I know a few good stories. They take place in a corner of America that might seem familiar, yet still manages to surprise. The settings are spectacular, the characters compelling, the action exciting, the plot lines unpredictable. I'm Tom Richardson. Join me as I explore New England's great outdoors, from Candlewood Lake, Connecticut to Caribou, Maine, from the beaches of Cape Cod to the peaks of New Hampshire's White Mountains. Stories are waiting. Let's live them on Explore New England. Explore New England is brought to you by your New England Ford dealers, your local REI co-op, REI believes a life outside is fundamental to a life well lived. GEICO, see how much you could save on more than just car insurance. Visit NewEngland.com and Camping World. Is there anything more adorable than a baby diamondback terrapin? Well, how about a dozen of them? Wow, baby terrapins, huh? So these guys, where did they hatch? Right here at the sanctuary. It, how long ago? Um, about two hours ago. No way, are you serious? Well, our timing is impeccable. <laughs> That's amazing, look at them. How long ago did the female uh, lay the eggs? 61 days ago. 61 days yeah. exactly, is that is that par for the course? Is that pr yeah, pretty typical? This is pretty early, but um, <laughs> Yeah, this is our first nest, so it is mm -hmm. earlier, yeah. but... Wow. Every year is different. There's a lot of variation. If it's a warm summer, if there's a lot of rain, these things all factor in, and there's a wide range. So we basically start checking using volunteers twice a day. Once it gets to 50, 60 days, you know, it depends on the year, and then we're going out twice a day to make sure that they're um, not hatching yet. And if they are hatching, then... Um, We'll dig them up and, and help them into the world. It's a very satisfying thing oh, to do. I'm sure it to is. To like take this state listed, you know, threatened <laughs> species that occurs occurs very few places, um, doesn't occur anywhere north of here, um, very um, threatened in Massachusetts, to take them in your hands and kind of know that you protected them, you protected their nest from the predators and, and just kind of like send them off into the world. and. We have a lot of volunteers um, that we depend on for this project. I think they really enjoy that aspect of it. As someone interested in learning about the marine ecosystem on Cape Cod, I figured that the Massachusetts Audubon's Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary, which borders the southern part of Wellfleet Bay, was a good place to start. But tiny terrapins? They were a surprise. The only estuarine turtle in North America, diamondback terrapins are but one of many fascinating critters that make their home in the fecund salt marsh system and coastal forest comprising the sanctuary and the nearby bay, as I learned during a short walk with sanctuary science coordinator Mark Flaherty. Wellfleet is really special. The Outer Cape is special to me. I'm an Outer Cape guy. I'm a little bit Outer Cape centric. This is where I've, I've done most of my work out here from basically Wellfleet out to Provincetown. The National, Cape Cod National Seashore is a really important part of what makes the Outer Cape what it is. The sheer amount of protected space for outdoor recreation and nature um, is really unusual. The big wild protected beaches on the ocean side of East Ham, Wellfleet, Truro, Provincetown. I mean, that's really unique in the Northeast. And then the bay side, you know, the, the oysters of Wellfleet, the, the working fishing communities. I mean, the Outer Cape has a real character um, where people are, are working in nature, right? We don't really have industries. Right? We don't have tall buildings. We don't have factories. Um, a lot of our industries depend upon the natural environment. So it's a perfect place for an organization like Mass Audubon to be because people are already in tune with nature here and we can kind of build on that. Several walking trails lead through different parts of the sanctuary affording visitors ample opportunity to view a wide variety of birds and other animals. The sanctuary also features a nature center filled with educational exhibits, including large tanks containing local fish and shellfish. A 
A big part of what makes Wellfleet Bay such a productive ecosystem is its mix of fresh and salt water. In the northern part of the bay, the Herring River teems with life during the warmer months. But the river's productivity has actually been compromised for over a hundred years, as I learned from Audubon Wellfleet Sanctuary Director Emeritus, Bob Prescott. So Bob, tell me about the, the, the dike on the Herring River. Like when, when was it built, first of all? Sure, this, uh, it was first put in in 1909. It was a huge project and they dug out you know, sand from both sides and you know, sort of met in the middle and, and dammed it up. I think it failed once and then they finally settled it and they did it. And diking of salt marshes back then, in the late 1800s, early 1900s was very common. They diked off the Indian Neck Marsh. But this was a huge salt marsh, 600 acres. So, so the move, movement now is to, is to try to find a way to take it out. Right? Yes, exactly. To so rebuild the, yeah, the whole thing is to rebuild this structure because you, you've, you know, unfortunately you've got to leave parts of it. It's, you, know, you, you would have to build a road out here anyways because it's, you know, it's an island, a big island. It was settled and there was a community and all of that. So you, know, you have to have a road. Well, how do you do it? And rather than filling the whole thing is you've just got to create the biggest opening you possibly can engineer, from an engineering standpoint. Once it's built, it'll take 25 years to come up with a monitoring and after monitoring it, what's the right mix? When do you flood? When do you not flood? Because everything's going to change upstream. Right now, it's the marsh is subsided. It's, it's, it's gone. It's got to rebuild. How do they rebuild it? And then you've got to uh, let it flood and you don't want to flood too much. You don't want too much dieback. So there's a lot of, there's there's a a lot lot of stuff. This is the most heavily studied project um, anywhere on Cape Cod, with the exception of the Superfund site at the, you know, the Mass Military Reservation and the Air Force Base. So what do you envision, Bob, when, when, when the dike is finally gone and the water flow is established uh, to its, its, yeah. its, its historic uh, levels? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what do you, how do you see the, uh, the landscape changing around the river? Well, you, you, behind it or over here, where you see a lot of salt marsh all around us. And on, if you, on the other side, it's a degraded salt marsh. So eventually you're going to have salt marsh going way, way upstream. And so, as I said, acre for acre, that's where, you know, all of our shellfish, all the food is coming from. So that's going to, you know, restore itself and then it'll work its way eventually all, all, all the way up. So you're going to get that. You're going to get storm water. And then from a wildlife standpoint, you know, everything is sort of blocked here. You know, a few herring get through, but not like the, the run that, you know, used to be here. So eventually you're going to have a really vigorous herring run, which is going to mean more fish in the harbor, especially when the fry start going downstream about this time of year and then on out into the, you know, out into the harbor. So we're going to see a lot of change. Birds are going to adapt and evolve and, and, uh, and make a, take advantage of, of the restoring habitat. Great. Well, I can't wait. To, uh, hopefully, yeah, I mean, I'll be around to, to see it happen, right? Yeah, I'm on the borderline on this one. <laughs> well, let's meet yeah. up in uh, 25 years, all right? That's yeah, a date. That's a date. <laughs> now that I'd had a wide-angle view of Wellfleet Bay, it was time to zoom in and get my feet wet. Assisting me in this endeavor was Mike Morrison and Deidre Detjens of Rideaway Adventures. Born and raised on the Cape. Sandwich is where I've, you know, that's, that's where I grew up. Uh, two teachers as my parents, so I've been outside and on the beach since I can remember. So the water has always been part of my life, and then as I grew up, just finding different ways to explore it, and that's where kayaking came in. What makes kayaking on the Cape so special is you immediately become part of that ecosystem and that environment. It's, um, you know, we don't do, in our two locations in Sandwich and Mashpee, we don't, and a lot of people get nervous about it, we don't do a lot of open ocean kayaking, we're in tidal flats, we're in estuaries, we're in bays, because you are immediately part of that system. Um, so birds react to you differently. Everything isn't running away from you. It's just acting around you. So for me, I've always like loved that portion of it and getting to introduce other people to it um, is a huge part of it. It's that, it's that they get to smell, touch, feel, um, what the Cape's all about and you know that area of kayaking is, is a huge part of it and paddle boarding same thing you, you get to be a part of it which is my favorite part about kayaking and paddle boarding. After meeting at the Herring River Mike, Deidre and I paddled down river through the area known as the gut and into the bay skirting the shoreline of Great Island which is part of the Cape Cod National Seashore. All around us tightly packed schools of filter feeding menhaden swirled a key source of prey for osprey, striped bass, and bluefish. Just off a long sandbar extending from the eastern tip of Great Island, we got up close and personal with a gang of turkey vultures. 
Mark was right. It was a different experience meeting them at eye level. After a half hour paddle, we beached our kayaks on Great Island's southern shore and wandered the deserted beach. So, horseshoe crab. You get a lot of these around here, huh? It's the time of year when um, horseshoe crabs that are not quite adults, they only molt once a year. So when they're real young, they molt, molt multiple times a year, but at this size, they're usually only molting once a year. And horseshoe crabs are not true crabs. In fact, they're more closely related to spiders, arachnids, mm -hmm. and they molt out the front oh, wow. no of kidding. their- Wow, So that's where, ah. Yeah. So that, that thing just came it out. It crawled out. <laughs> it's, ex, it's exoskeleton, which is hard <laughs> yeah. now, was really soft, so it could move out. Mm -hmm. And then it buried itself in the sand until its skin- Because it's, it's vulnerable, obviously. Exactly, yeah, mm -hmm. until, it har until it hardened up a little bit. And these are some of the most amazing animals ever. They're, you know, they've just re-aged them a few years ago. They're now, they think, 450 million years old, which like, outdoes the dinosaurs. Oh, Horseshoe crab sheds in all sizes litter the shores of Great Island. But what we weren't expecting to find was the carcass of a dolphin among the marsh grass. Dolphins and small whales frequently strand in Wellfleet Harbor after getting trapped in the shallows by the receding tide. The theory is that the marine mammals often follow the shoreline of Cape Cod Bay, which leads them into the confined harbor and its maze of rivers and creeks. Such stranding events often lead to dramatic rescue efforts by volunteers who must carry or drag the animals to deeper water. While paddling is a popular way to access Great Island, you can also get there on foot via a trail that starts at the parking lot off Chequesset Neck Road and runs between the Herring River Marsh and the dunes. Parts of this path flood at high tide, so plan accordingly unless you don't mind soggy shoes. Breaks in the dunes lead to the long beach skirting Cape Cod Bay, making this a great option for beachgoers who want to avoid the crowds while getting some exercise in the process. Keep going and you'll reach Great Island itself, where you can take either the Tavern Loop Trail or the much longer trail leading all the way to the Jeremy Point Overlook. At low tide, the point extends another one and a half miles or so, but the exposed sandbar quickly disappears as the tide floods, creating a series of low-lying islands that serve as nesting sites for plovers and other shorebirds. Boaters can beach their craft or anchor near shore and use the sandy perimeter of the islands, and I did just that after renting a 16-foot Boston whaler at Wellfleet Marine Corporation right on the harbor. Wellfleet Marine was started by my great-grandfather, Warren Harrington. Everyone knew him as Bing. That was back in 1954. So he had a boat yard, which we still have up in Holbrook Avenue here. He started with boat rentals. He also used to run the fuel dock, which now we just do boat rentals the boat yard, and we also run our own lobster boats and shellfish grants as well. When people rent boats, typically they'll go to the beach. Um, they go to either Great Island or Jeremy Point. That is all national seashore beaches. You either get there by a five mile hike or you go by boat. So most people won't lug all the stuff out there to go to the beach, so they do go by boat. But people will take them just for a cruise around the harbor. They'll go fishing with them because there are fish in the harbor and there are fishing spots. And some people would just go out there and have a picnic. Some people would just go out in the middle of the harbor and just float for a while because it's quiet and peaceful and they're getting away from everyone. So growing up here, we always thought it was normal, everything that we did. We were always just around the water. I mean, everyone asks us whether we learned how to drive a car or drive a boat first, but the real question is whether we learned how to walk or drive a boat first, because that's really more about the same time frame. So all of it was normal. There's pictures of us when we were three and four walking around on the docks with life jackets, because we always had to have our life jackets on up until we were 12, because that's what the actual rule was. And our grandmother always caught us when we tried to skip on that rule. But we were always allowed to take boats out and do whatever we wanted. We always did it in twos. We used to have little wooden skiffs that we built ourselves. And those we always put in the water two at a time. So it was always two of us little kids that were running them down the bay first thing in the spring, and that was basically where we started running boats. And that was when we were four, five, and six. I can't imagine living anywhere else. I mean, I went through the school district here. I went all the way up through elementary school, middle school, high school. 
And there was a lot of kids that I went to school with from up Cape that had no idea what was going on down here. It's just like a whole different world than the last couple of towns out here. Wellfleet is its own world. Wellfleet Harbor is relatively broad and shallow, although recent dredging of the channel and inner basin has improved access for boaters. There are no full service marinas in Wellfleet, but transient boaters can often arrange for a temporary slip or mooring via the harbor master. Fuel is available at the town pier. A two lane launch ramp adjacent to the harbor master's office is available for those who wish to trailer their boat at a cost of $10 per day. The tide in Wellfleet Bay, which averages 10 feet, greatly affects both recreational and commercial pursuits. The twice daily rise and fall of water and attendant flushing of nutrients makes the bay an ideal location for growing oysters. Oystering is big business in Wellfleet, as evidenced by the thousands of oyster cages covering large swaths of the bay bottom and highlighted by the annual Oysterfest event held in October. While most of the oysters harvested in Wellfleet are grown in aquaculture operations, some are still harvested the old-fashioned way. Sonia Woodman is one of a handful of commercial shellfishers in Wellfleet who are licensed to sell wild oysters. Her workday revolves around the tides, as she only has a limited amount of time in which to gather the oysters from the rocks and get them to market. What I enjoy about shellfishing the most is the fact that you have to be out in nature and every day is a challenge. You know, every day you're up against the elements and there's just something beautiful about that, about realizing that it's blowing 30 miles per hour and it's, you know, 40 degrees or 30 degrees, whatever, depending on the season, and that you can do it. You can still get out there and get to work. You know, it, it doesn't have to be an obstacle unless you accept it as an obstacle. All right, so let's see what you got in the back of the truck here. Waders. Coolers are back there, and they're all, they're full of a mixture of ice and water. Mm -hmm. It's like an ice slurry, slurry yeah, mm -hmm. so um, so that I can just stick the bags right in there and I don't have to be shoveling ice. And why do you have, what, what's this watch for? On oh, the, so this <laughs> is for time. You need to get the oysters on ice within two hours, so I keep track of time. Mm -hmm. So this is an oyster measuring ring right here. I keep these things attached so I don't lose them. So I just keep these things clipped on me so I don't drop them. This is just, um, this is a half bushel basket which I use just because it's easier to carry. Some people use metal baskets, I just find these are lighter. Mm -hmm. um, gloves, so protect your hands, get some gloves, and yeah, and then, you know, bug spray and things like that, sunglasses, whatever else I need. So here's a clump of uh, lovely oysters. So Tell me about this whole situation here. So Great. what do you, so what do, you, you do? can see, I can tell in here that you've got a legal size oyster. Yeah, on my, first, my, my, my first try. Right, you just gotta separate it though, and you gotta do that carefully. I mean, if, you, if you're too aggressive in there, you, you're gonna crack that oyster open. Mm -hmm. So just kinda delicately. Pry them apart. Find little corners where you can pry them apart. Little weak spots. Maybe this one's too. Okay. So there yeah, you go. Sure oh, so you got top. another one on top of another that? Another one on top. And that, you think that's a winner? Oh, yeah, prove it to me with your handy dandy shelf. Do you want me to eat it? <laughs> you know what? We're going to do that. <laughs> yep. You know? So there you go. And that's a beautiful, beautiful wild, a beautiful wild oyster right there. All right. So, and so you didn't even measure them. You were that, you were that confident that that oh, was yeah, a legal absolutely. oyster. Like, so you can see there, that's like yeah. way over. Yeah. That's a, that's a that's keeper perfect, right there, right? huh? You know? All right, let's see you down one of those suckers. Oh yeah, no problem. This doesn't do, do you anything. like oysters? Did you always like oysters, anyways? Oh yeah. Look at that, right out of the sea. Oh, he's, uh, he doesn't want to let go. Oh, stop. <laughs> Beautiful. Best thing, there's always snacks out here. I guess, that's right. You never have to pack a. You never have to pack a granola bar, no, right? No, you got no, lots no. There's of, plenty lots of protein. protein. <laughs> While Sonia Woodman draws a living from the waters of Wellfleet, others draw inspiration. Case in point, Steve Swain, whose remarkable metal sculptures reflect his love of the ocean and the animals therein. Steve and his wife Sarah, a talented singer and musician who performs at many local venues, own the eclectic frying pan gallery, which occupies a former and now historic oyster shack at the corner of Commercial Street and Kendrick Ave.
So uh, we started the Frying Pan Gallery in 2008 when we were, um, I was redesigning the restaurant next door, which was Captain Higgins. It was a famous local place called the Spit and Chatter Club. We had been working on that building. This building was sitting here, um, basically falling down and I decided to rescue it and uh, turn it into something and it turned into the art gallery. Being able to open up a, a spot that is full of local art that also preserves our local architectural history has really just been a joy for us. Hey Steve, uh, this wall of fish is uh, pretty impressive. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, so how, how long does it take you to make each one of these, what are these, Menhaden, right? Yep, these are Menhaden. Uh, they, the, I don't make them individually, that we make massive amounts mm -hmm. of them, myself and a couple other guys that work with me. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's a it's a project and it's be, it's grown into something that was much more than I thought it would ever be mm -hmm. when I first started doing it. Now, why why the focus uh, on Manhattan? Uh, well, I I've been a big proponent of of uh, the conservation of this particular fish. Um, growing up, there was always piles and piles of them everywhere, and they were not edible, so people considered them to be trash fish. Over time, people start realizing, well, this fish is so important because everything else in the ocean eats it other than humans. So I do uh, installations like this in people's homes and businesses, um, starting from a design on, on a computer, and then um, I actually go in and do the installations. Well, I used to design and build restaurants, so I, I still have that connection to that industry. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of my artwork in restaurants, whether straight up purchases or some of the people I know and we we barter off so that we we eat at restaurants or in, in exchange <laughs> we, we pay we pay with these they're yeah. kind of like coins but you know. that's right it's right. the new, new yeah. currency it is it's, it's my currency Cape currency yeah, it is Cape currency exactly tell me about the right whale Steve um, this is a pretty neat sculpture thank you yeah so the right whale is a very important species for here uh, or for everywhere really, uh, but it is the North Atlantic right whale and it's been um, a very challenged um, species. Uh, a lot of issues with entanglement, a lot of issues with ship strikes and the numbers are really low. Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown who were donating a portion of the proceeds from the sales of these, of these pieces here, um, they have a program that's just helping to monitor the health and, and, um, and they have a disentanglement team. Um, and they are big proponents and big uh, champions of the, of the right whales. They're a champion of every species of whale, but they're focusing on right whales because they're the, the species that needs the most attention right now. Yeah, there's only like 500 oh, yeah, left or something Yeah, some, like something around 400, yeah. 400, yeah. that's amazing. Yep, so we're just trying to bring awareness to that uh, yeah. with, the, with the sculpture and getting, directing people's attention to the Center for Coastal Studies. And you know, a lot of it has to do with this eye right here. If you look closely at it, it's, it, it convinces you to buy the sculpture. What's it made of? Uh, it's, a, it's actually a, a chrome ball bearing, but I think it's because it's so clean that you can see yourself in it. Steve and Sarah Swain are just two of the people who have come to appreciate Wellfleet's unique character, one that sets it apart from other Cape Cod towns. Perhaps it has something to do with the tides, or the ocean, or the fertile waters of the bay. Or perhaps it's best left a mystery, something to figure out for yourself. Sarah, take us out, please. Thank you.